There's a thought in our modern world that because the New Testament is a record of Jesus and his work of salvation, we can basically do away with the Old Testament and all its teachings. Now, if you're someone who thrives on things like efficiencies, that would be a great outcome because the Old Testament actually makes up 39 books of a 66-book Bible. But is that really what God intended or even what the Bible teaches us? Can we simply cast away almost 60% of the Bible because we've been told the Old Testament is no longer relevant by modern critics? If you're one for six, you'll find that the Old Testament was written over a period of almost 900 years compared to the New Testament that was written over about 50 years. If you were to go on word count, the Old Testament has approximately 622,700 words compared to 184,600 in the New Testament. So this means that the Old Testament makes up 75% of the word count of the Bible. So can we then really ignore it when we're looking at the gospel message or can we ignore it when we're looking at the revealed purpose of God that is contained in the pages of the Bible? Some have even suggested in our modern day that the New Testament is actually a replacement for the Old Testament. So we can therefore disregard the Old Testament altogether. There's even some who suggest that the God of the Old Testament is a different God to the God of the New Testament. Well, with our Bibles before us tonight, we're going to show you that these theories are, in fact, incorrect and that the Old Testament should be read in conjunction with the New Testament to provide a complete picture of the revealed word of God and his glorious purpose, which he will bring to pass on the earth and the wonderful offering of hope that God has presented to us all. Now, if you were to search the Bible using the many electronic means we have available to us today, you'll find that the term gospel is not actually found in the Old Testament. That is strictly from a word search viewpoint. So I guess we've really set ourselves quite a challenge tonight to try and show that the gospel is based on and is actually found in the Old Testament. Well, to begin unravelling our challenge then, I think we might start by just categorically concluding that the gospel was preached in the Old Testament times and then we can know for sure that when we go and find it, we'll actually, sorry, when we go searching for it, we'll actually find it. So if we just look at what we had Micah read this evening in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, It says there, and the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So this is important because it's the direct confirmation that the gospel did appear in the Old Testament, despite it not being specifically named. So whatever the gospel was, it was preached to the man Abraham. Now, if you come over in your Bibles a few pages to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2, we're going to look at another instance referred to referring to the gospel in the Old Testament times. Now, in Hebrews chapter 4, the apostles talking about the nation of Israel in the wilderness. If you look at chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it's talking about the nation that came out of Egypt under Moses. And excuse me, and what the apostle says in chapter 4, verse 2 is, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. So what he's saying is the same gospel that was preached to the nation of Israel who came out of Egypt under Moses and the gospel that was preached to the New Testament ecclesia, it was the same gospel. So what the apostle is showing is that the same gospel, whatever that might be, whatever the gospel might be, it was preached to Abraham and it was also preached to the nation of Israel in the times of Moses. So here I guess we could say we have confirmation that the gospel is based on and is founding the Old Testament. So with that, let's go searching together to find what the Bible tells us about this gospel. 
I guess to start with, let's first establish the fundamentals of gospel. Now, when we use the term gospel, we're obviously referring to something specific. In the age we live in, the term is used as being synonymous with something that is absolutely true and reliable, and it's probably not appreciated how accurate that definition is in our modern world, but that is for another time. The word gospel first begins to appear in the Bible in the records of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, which is why they are often referred to as the four gospel records. So let's use the following passages to try and establish what what is meant by gospel. So if we look in Luke chapter 9 and verse 2, we see that it says that, and he, that's Jesus, sent them, his disciples, he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So Christ sent out his disciples to preach the kingdom of God. And then it tells us how that happened. In verse 6, it tells us, it says, They departed and went forth into the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So so this shows us that the gospel is actually the gospel of the kingdom of God. Luke, uh, sorry, and then if we look in verse 11 again, it says, that And the people, when they knew it, followed him, and he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God, and healed them that had need of healing. So Luke uses different terms, but by doing so, he shows us that the gospel is about the kingdom of God. Let's look at another example of this. Back one chapter, in Luke chapter 8, verse 1. It tells us that he, that's he, Jesus, went through every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. So now in this place, we have them combined together. Glad tidings is actually what the term gospel means. So it could be read as simply being, he went through every, throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, these aren't the only examples from the gospel records. We could look at places like Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. It says there, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. In places like Mark chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So this same gospel is what was taught by the apostles of Jesus when he commissioned them to go into the world and preach the gospel in Mark chapter 16. And in carrying out this commission, we have recorded for us in places like Acts chapter 12, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised. So having established that the gospel as revealed in the New Testament has relation to the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, I want to now just have a very specific look at the preaching mission of the Apostle Paul and what he says about the gospel. Paul actually provides us a really clear summary of all his preaching work when he stood before King Agrippa. And his words before King Agrippa are recorded for us in Acts 26 and verse 6. He says there, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto the fathers, which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. So Paul here tells us that he's called before King Agrippa because of the hope of the promises made of God unto the fathers. Now, if you keep that phrase, the promises made unto the fathers, in your mind, we're going to find it later in a little moment. But let's see what else Paul uses to describe his preaching when he was on his missionary work. In Acts chapter 28, verse 23, It says that, and when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning until evening. And then at the bottom of that page, in verse 31, Paul tells us, 
that he continued preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So from these three references in Acts 26, Acts 28, verse 23, and then verse 31, we find that Paul the Apostle taught the gospel, and that gospel was linked to the promises made of God unto the fathers, and it pertained to the things of the kingdom of God and the things of the name of Jesus Christ. Now, we could have used this verse earlier when we showed the gospel is found in the Old Testament because verse 23 tells us that Paul expounded to them about the kingdom of God and persuaded them concerning Jesus Christ. And he did all of that out of the law of Moses and the prophets, or what we might call the Old Testament. And so for Paul to have done that, the gospel must be based and found in the Old Testament. So the apostles of Jesus taught the gospel as the good news of the kingdom of God and the things concerning Jesus Christ. We're told by Paul when he stood before King Agrippa that this is synonymous with the promises made unto the fathers and that this is all based on the teachings of the Old Testament. Now, just to round out all of this, let's come to Romans chapter 15 and verse 8. And we read in Romans 15 verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So now we can link all these together and see that Jesus confirmed the promises made unto the fathers and these promises are then the basis of the gospel message that he preached and that his apostles preached. So to really understand what this all means then, we really need to understand what the promises made unto the fathers is actually referring to. In the Bible, there's two great promises made in the Old Testament. They're called in the New Testament exceeding great and precious. They were made to two men, Abraham and David, and they were reiterated to the nation of Israel, and it was these two promises that are the basis of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll look at them in order and then I'll show you how these promises are directly linked to the gospel message of Jesus and his apostles. Abraham was a, was a faithful man who lived about 4,000 years ago, the last time I checked. And because of his faith in God, he was given a series of promises from God. We might actually turn these up in your Bibles if we come back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. We read there in Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And this is the promise that we mentioned earlier that Paul confirms for us in our reading tonight of Galatians 3 verse 8 as the gospel that was preached to Abraham. And now if we move over one page, we come to Genesis 13 verse 14 to 17. We read there. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which thou sayest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the length of, sorry, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Now, that last verse is really the key to the promise because it tells us what it was actually in relation to. God had promised Abraham and his seed the possession of the land forever, and Abraham was then commanded to walk through it. 
He was to literally walk the length and breadth of his promised inheritance. See, the promise to Abraham had relation to a vast tract of the earth. It it wasn't in heaven and, and it's not anywhere else. It was visible before Abraham and he literally walked through it. Now, this promise of the land is important with the connection to the gospel. If we jump back over to Galatians chapter 3, we find that Paul tells us something specific about this promise, actually, in Galatians 3 and verse 16. It tells us there, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So this now links us with the gospel message of the New Testament. The promise that was made to Abraham was the eternal possession of himself and his seed, singular, Jesus Christ. And the promise that was made to Abraham, it actually had a specific time frame attached to it. It tells us that it was to be inherited by Abraham and his seed forever. This is important because this has another connection with the promise made to David which explains the need for everlasting life. So the promise to Abraham gives us the location of the kingdom spoken of in the gospel, and it draws our attention to the promised seed who would inherit the earth and subsequently bless all nations. Now, the promise to Abraham is only one part of the gospel message. The first part of the gospel message has a relation to the kingdom of God. And this promise was made to one of the greatest kings of Israel's history, King David. David lived almost 3,000 years ago, and when he reached a point of stability in his kingdom, he desired to build a house for God to dwell among his nation in Jerusalem. But God instructed David that his son was going to build the temple in Jerusalem. And then he proceeded to give David a most wonderful promise. He gives that to us, and that's recorded for us in 2 Samuel 7, verse 8 to 17. But because time is short this evening, I I just want to look at the key verses. So we're going to look at verse 11 to 14, and then verse 16 as well. So what it says there is, Also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. And then in verse 16, And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So this Wonderful promise completes for us then the gospel message preached unto the Father, unto the fathers, the exceeding great and precious promises. David was promised by God that he would have a son and that God would establish his kingdom forever. And this confirmed to David that out of his lineage would come the promised seed who would rule over the kingdom of Israel and over the earth forever. And just to show you that Jesus was the fulfilment of the promise made unto David. Let's have a look at Luke chapter 1, <laughs> verse 30 to 33. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So here we have irrefutable evidence from the mouth of the angel of God himself that Jesus was the fulfilment of the promised seed of David. He was the one to whom the kingdom was promised, and he was to possess it forever. Now, these two great promises made unto the fathers are the whole gospel as believed by the true followers of Jesus Christ. He is the promised seed of Abraham who is to take possession of the earth and rule over the established kingdom of Israel forever 
which is what was promised to David. This was the gospel message that was preached by Paul that we read of in Acts chapter 28. Now, having established these promises made unto the fathers are the basis of the gospel, I just want to go back one step and draw your attention to something important. Because if we went back <clears throat> to the record of Luke chapter 8, we'll note that what was taught was the gospel of the kingdom. But if you look carefully at what was preached by Philip in Acts chapter 8, we find it refers to the gospel of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Now, this appears to be different. The gospel that was mentioned as being taught by Jesus in Luke that we looked at earlier, it now seems to have an addition of the name of Jesus Christ when it was preached by Philip. But in reality, it isn't any additions. When the gospel was preached by Jesus and his disciples before his crucifixion and resurrection, it spoke concerning the kingdom of God. But after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the gospel now proclaimed that the promised seed that was spoken of in the Old Testament and that was specifically linked to the gospel and the promises, this previously unknown seed, it was now confirmed to be Jesus Christ by his death and his resurrection. And this seed now being confirmed, the gospel that was preached after Jesus rose from the dead was the good news of the kingdom of God on earth and the promised seed, its everlasting king, Jesus Christ. Now, if you cast your, your minds back to the words we read in Acts chapter 28, Paul tells us that he preached the gospel from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So this means that the gospel message is not restricted to only the promises made to Abraham and David because it's actually the theme of the invitation of God to all that they can join in the blessed time to come upon the earth. And you will find that message is contained in other portions of the Old Testament. And just to prove this to you, let's turn over to the prophecy of Daniel and Daniel chapter 2. Now, Daniel was a captive in the land of Babylon during the Jewish captivity that took place after the destruction of Jerusalem and the removal of the kingdom of Israel. And this prophet revealed a message from God. In the days of the captivity of Israel and Judah, God sent a message to the king of Babylon by a dream. And what he dreamed was a frightful sight. We're told in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 2 that the, this great and powerful king, was, he was troubled in spirit and he, his sleep left him. What the king dreamed was a mighty warrior made up of different metals which stood upon its feet. And this great warrior statue, it was then smashed to pieces by a stone cut out of a mountain without human hands. And we're told that the stone broke the pieces so much so that they became chaff and they're carried away with the wind. We're then told that this stone was subsequently, it grew into a great mountain and it filled the whole earth. Daniel then proceeds to provide the king of Babylon with a detailed explanation of the dream. And after explaining the various metals as representative of powers throughout the passage of history from Babylon onwards, Daniel arrives at the explanation of the stone. So let's jump in then. At verse 44, we read there, <clears throat> And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other peoples, sorry, other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, this explanation by Daniel we might describe it in other terms as the gospel message. What Daniel described is in the latter days or in the days when this image empire will stand on its feet, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom on the ruin of all these kingdoms. Now, these kingdoms, if you go through the prophecy in your own time, they had territory and dominion on the earth. 
So what Daniel 44 is telling us, sorry, Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 is telling us, is that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom on earth which will never be destroyed. It will not be left to other people and it will stand forever. And that language is the exact same message that was delivered to David in his promise in 2 Samuel chapter 7 concerning the everlasting kingdom. He was promised an everlasting king who would rule over the kingdom of God on earth forever. So this prophecy is is simply a reiteration of the promises made to Abraham and to David that God has purpose to establish a kingdom which he promised to David on the earth which he promised to Abraham and his seed and it will last forever. So combine together the gospel message. Now, we could go all night tonight and we could do this with about every book of the Bible, but we might just look at one more <clears throat> quotation in the Old Testament and that is in the words of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. We read in the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So here we have another example of the gospel recorded in the Old Testament, the promised establishment of the kingdom of God forever and the promised seed of David, which we saw in Luke, is Jesus Christ. Here we're told that the increase of the government and peace will have no end, that this kingdom will be established on the throne of David that links us directly back to the promise that we read of in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, these are just a few examples of the many references in the Old Testament to the promises made of God unto the fathers, which speak of the gospel of the kingdom of God established on the earth and the promised seed, Jesus Christ. One might even say that everywhere you turn in the Old Testament, you will find references to the promises of God and the blessed hope that those promises provide in the gospel. Now, what we saw in in the prophecy of Daniel is that the promise made of God unto the fathers requires the existence of immortal people who will leave the, who will never leave the kingdom to other people. This same requirement is necessary for the promise to Abraham to take everlasting possession of the earth. You can only take everlasting possession if you never die. But how can this happen seeing as man is mortal and there's no immortal existence within him? We don't really have time to go into this in detail tonight. It's been dealt with many times by others concerning Bible teaching on the mortality of man. But if we just accept that as a Bible teaching, The question I think arises is how do people like you and me who are mortal and dying, how do we possibly join the ranks of the immortal possessors of the kingdom of God on earth? I guess to answer this as simply and as succinctly as I possibly can, the gospel. Come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. It speaks about, <clears throat> what it's talking about here is about God and it's talking about the means of salvation that he has offered to all. What it says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 10 is, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So here is the key to answering our question. 
The gospel that was preached by Jesus and his apostles, the same gospel that is based out of the promises contained in the Old Testament, that gospel provides us with the knowledge and with the ability to gain eternal life and to join in the eternal possession of the earth and the eternal possession of the kingdom. This passage in 2 Timothy tells us that life and immortality has been brought to light by the gospel because the gospel was revealed. So before the gospel was revealed, these matters were unknown. But it's only through association with the true gospel that immortality can be gained. It's not something that we have right now. The Bible teaches us that it is a gift of God which will be given at a coming time. And it is only by his mercy that we have opportunity to be granted immortal life. So if we come back then to the verse that we mentioned at the start of our talk, let's have a look at Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and verse 16. And this is Christ speaking to his disciples. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Now, the simple teaching of Jesus is that belief in the gospel and baptism are required. Now, whilst a simple command, it's not as simple as saying you believe and then being dipped in water. True baptism only occurs when someone understands and believes fully the gospel message. That is, in its entirety, the things concerning the kingdom of God on earth and the things concerning its king and its promised seed, Jesus Christ. You cannot believe only in Jesus and not in the promises made to the fathers and expect to be saved through baptism. Likewise, You cannot believe in the coming kingdom of God and not the things of Jesus Christ and expect to be saved. Belief in the gospel requires an entire, complete understanding of the great and precious promises made unto the fathers and a belief that Jesus Christ is that promised seed and that promised king who will establish God's kingdom on earth, which will last forever. And once this is believed and understood, the Bible tells us that we are required to submit to baptism. Now, why is this important in relation to the gospel? We might try and argue that surely God, who is all wise and all knowing, he can look into my heart and see that I understand the gospel message fully. Why must I be submersed in water? Well, the Bible firstly teaches us that faith without works is dead. But secondly, When we're looking at the promises made to Abraham and to David, you may recall that they were made to Abraham and his seed, which Paul confirms for us was not seeds as of many, but one, one seed. Unto Abraham and his seed, Jesus Christ, was the promise of eternal possession of the earth made. This same message was delivered to King David. One seed would be king over an everlasting kingdom which we saw confirmed in Luke chapter 1, was Jesus Christ. So if the gospel message is the same message as was delivered in the Old Testament and the New Testament has not altered the gospel that was preached, what ought we to do to be saved and to join this blessed hope? Well, let's come over then to tie all these things together to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. where we read in verse 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So here is our answer. Belief and understanding of the entire gospel message is required and the means of salvation that God has provided is baptism into the name of Jesus Christ. 
Baptism into the name of Jesus Christ is the only way that we in this age can become Christ. And if Christ, then we become Abraham's seed and we become heirs to the exceeding great and precious promises. And that is the blessed hope that is contained in the gospel message that is based in the Old Testament. God, in his great love and mercy, he has offered to all the opportunity of participation in this coming kingdom, which is to be established on earth and to partake of eternal life. It is because of this great hope contained in its pages that we really encourage you to search your Bible. We encourage you to respond to this invitation of God and to submit to his requirements so that when his son returns to this earth, you will be found worthy to join him in his kingdom when he takes eternal possession of the earth.